so well, thanks so much for everyone for sticking with us for today. Uh, right now, we're excited to announce our, our final speaker here, Paul Brody from Ernst & Young. Um, he's in a, you know, just amazing, I mean, you know, highly regarded, uh, just you know, a thinker and, and just a builder in the space. And so it's a pleasure to have him here. It's a pleasure to have him uh, give his take on Filecoin. And he also had an op-ed in Coindesk today saying that we're in the, the final crypto winter. So we, I'm so glad that very you prophetic. That. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully true. Hopefully true. Uh, but anyway, so take it away, Paul. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So um, yeah, I'm Paul Brody, global blockchain leader at EY. Um, I've been at EY for about eight years now. I love this. I got the, the timer on already. Um, 53, 50. Oh, I'm not going to worry about that too much. I've got a quick presentation, 200 slides. Uh, it's very easy. We're the big four. We, we like our slides. Um, we're actually a little bit unusual at EY. We're uh, really, really laser focused on public blockchains uh, and, and kind of thinking strategically about the ecosystem. We never really were very excited about private blockchains. Like, I still can't really understand what is the point of a centrally managed decentralized ledger, but you know, uh, <laughs> apparently some people bought them. Uh, but what I want to talk to you today about is, is really about the stuff that we're thinking about, particularly around this, this idea of scaling. So we are, we're pretty early on in the blockchain ecosystem game. We're somewhat later on. One of the things that's interesting about technology ecosystems is platforms mature and they become dominant actually before all the use cases or the massive use is, is, is scales out. So for example, if you think about like, PCs, for example, so Windows and Mac were the dominant PC operating systems long before PCs became widely available, right, and that everybody had them. And the same kind of thing is going on here. Right now today, the number of companies that are actually using enterprise blockchain, blockchain technology, whether it's in decentralized computing or, or other types of activities, is relatively small. But the standards are already emerging, and the business cases are starting to solidify. And, and what I want to talk about a little bit is kind of where do we see things going, particularly outside of financial services, which I, people tend to spend... I think we spend much too much time in the world of blockchain worrying about DeFi and financial services and not nearly enough time worrying about kind of the real world use cases, whether it's compute, storage, or supply chain and business operations. So I'm going to really talk about kind of the, the scalability part. Um, you'll notice here, like, uh, we're, we're, out of the, we're fully out of the closet EY. We're ETH maxis. Um, uh, and and uh, that's, that's something that we're, we're pretty open and direct about. We're very, very focused and strategic in our thinking about blockchain ecosystems. We are focused on the, the largest dominant ecosystem. So we use IPFS. Um, we, we develop pretty much exclusively on Ethereum uh, and primarily public Ethereum. Uh, so we're, we're, our goal is not to be mediocre at a dozen different platforms. Our goal is to be the best at the largest platforms. So uh, disclaimer, uh, you cannot hold us responsible for anything that we say. I don't know why, but uh, that's me. All righty. So we have a vision of kind of how enterprises will use blockchain. And, and it's actually pretty easy to sum it up in a single message, which is a single sentence, which is this. We believe blockchains will do for business ecosystems what ERP did inside the enterprise. Now, how many of everybody here should know what ERP is? Or have post-ERP implementation trauma, depending on how old you are. Um, and you know, if you've forgotten, right, what ERP did inside the enterprise, it standardized process and data, right? You know, if, if you take a traditional manufacturing environment, you configured stuff, you ordered it, you made it, you shipped it, you built for it, and as long as you were very integrated as an enterprise, the ERP ecosystem gave you this end-to-end -end picture of how things went, right? And, and the CEO of the company said, listen, I don't care what you like or you want, we're all using SAP or Oracle or some other single platform. And it was a it was a very ruthless top-down process, and it worked very well inside of large enterprises. It obviously doesn't work in a broader ecosystem, right? Occasionally, you have an 800-pound gorilla, right? Uh, and, and when they come to you, as I would say, like, when the world's largest retailer asks you to join their blockchain, they're not asking. They're very politely telling you what is required, right? Uh, but in general, right, at the, the, the enterprise ecosystem, across, what, you know, the reality is, is there are no companies like this. There are no companies that have control over this. I think 
If you're a big fan of industrial history, which is just probably in this room me, um, you know that like back in the 1950s, Ford had this factory called the River Rouge Complex in Detroit. Basically, like dirt went in on one side and cars came out on the other. They had they had a steel mill, they had a glass works. I mean, they were they were very unusual in that they they were atypical in the sense that they were highly highly ver vertically integrated. Today, you know, much better example I think of the prototypical factory today is the Shenzhen iPhone assembly plant, right? Uh, they make phones for a company that doesn't own the factory, right? And in fact, doesn't really have a single manufacturing facility, right? That makes a lot of sense today. And in fact, you know, basically today, you know, the, the real truth about sort of digital ecosystems is they're incredibly siloed, right? And I love it when people say we got to digitize our data. It's all digital, right? It's just in like 35 different silos. And every time stuff moves from one silo to the other, it gets recreated. Things don't actually move from the raw material supplier to the OEM. That's not how it works. The raw material supplier makes stuff and has their own digital records, and then the OEM basically makes a whole new set of digital records, right? And this is why if you ask a company how much money they have, they can tell you with precision, but if you ask them how much inventory they have, they're like, oh, about two weeks, right? Because banks are very disciplined in how they handle money, and enterprises are completely undisciplined about how they handle everything else. You can go into any enterprise system make inventory appear, you can make it disappear, like, there's no control, right? Blockchains, the beauty of blockchain is you can define any asset, and it will apply the same discipline to that asset as a bank applies to money, right? And, and with that, you could actually have an incredibly precise, continuous environment instead of this process where we, we move information by fax and EDI or PDF or Excel spreadsheet, right? It's, it's a mess. Um, Right? Blockchains and smart contracts can fix that. Right? We can have digital tokens that we create and actually move through the entire process, and we can have smart contracts that govern the movement of these assets. Right? We can basically create like a digital twin of your ecosystem with tokens and assets and business agreements end to end. Right? Um, and the returns on this are actually really huge. And I'll share with you a good case example. Now, this is a case example from a permissioned blockchain. So full disclosure, we didn't have the technology to implement privacy. But it was a really excellent use case. Um, we built for Microsoft, and they still use uh, an EY-developed Ethereum, a permissioned Ethereum chain for all of the Xbox video game procurement. If you buy a video game on the Xbox network, it's processed by a smart contract that was developed by EY. And the returns on this were incredible. We took the cycle time to process monthly transaction sort of summaries for clients from 45 days down to basically like two or three minutes, right? So huge cycle time improvement. Um, even when we incorporated all the costs of building an entirely new network, you know, kind of doing a lot of this stuff for the first time, migrating, I think, something on the order of 30,000 contracts is still 40% cheaper than the prior system and far fewer disputes between buyer and seller because the logic is transparent, right? So we know there's an enormous payoff from going to smart contracts, and this is just one kind of node in a, in a very complex network. And unfortunately... Because it was done on a permission chain, it can never be deployed kind of onto the public ecosystem. But we are, we're very sort of bullish on kind of this whole range of use cases that are, are coming forward, right? Inventory management, contract management, product traceability, cross-border trade, emissions tracking, public sector accountability. There's a ton of different use cases that involve basically the standard model of like, you've got money, you're exchanging money for stuff under the terms of a business agreement, and you need to keep track and understand the results of what you got. Um, three things are kind of holding us back from this, this future state. The first, we need private transfers and payments, right? If you think about almost any enterprise environment, what you sell, what you buy, and how much you pay for it is among the most sensitive business information. Everybody knows Apple buys memory chips from Samsung and Micron. What nobody knows, other than Samsung and Micron, is how much they're paying for them, right? And similarly, you don't want to disclose how many are coming, when they're arriving, where they're going. Like, that's, 
again, sensitive business information. We need the private transfers of assets and payments. Secondly, we need private business logic. Like, I don't even need to look at where your data is going or what your stuff is doing if I can see the contract that you signed to buy it. It specifies the expected volumes, your standardized discounts, the terms and conditions. Those are super sensitive as well. So we need private transfers and payments, private business logic, and, and most importantly, we need a level of scalability which people have not really thought about to date. Um, right? And that's not just transactional scalability, that's compute and data storage scalability. And I'm gonna come back to that last part uh, towards the end. Um, in terms of the, the private contracts, private contracts and payments, there's two components we need. Number one, this private assets and transfers, and number two, the private business logic, right? This is where the EY advertisement comes in. We are trying to specifically build this out. One of the things that's been interesting about looking around sort of the blockchain ecosystem is everybody wants to talk about scalability. That's like everyone's obsession. My own personal opinion is we will never really get to the level of scalability we should if we don't solve the privacy problem. Enterprises will not use any of this stuff without privacy. Um, so our focus, first and foremost, is on the privacy. We think that's one area we can make a big difference. We are working on three specific things to make that happen. Number one, we have created a layer two network for Ethereum called Nightfall. It is a ZK optimistic privacy rollup. So we're using zero knowledge for zero knowledge, not for, sca not just, not for scalability. It's called Nightfall, it's a, uh, it's actually, we showed our first prototype in 2018. Um, it's been a, a long, slow road. The first prototype, it cost $100 to execute a transaction at a time when ETH was $250 each. Yeah, it didn't, wasn't, wasn't cost effective. Um, uh, we, we are down to a, a much better level of performance. Uh, and, and it is live on the, it's alive as a layer two on the Polygon proof of stake network. Uh, we just deployed it about two weeks ago, and sometime in the next few weeks, we will deploy it as a layer two on Ethereum as well. Secondly, we've developed something called Starlight. So Nightfall is for moving stuff around under privacy. Starlight is a zero-knowledge circuit compiler. So we tried, the first thing we tried was to teach our software developers how to make zero-knowledge circuits. This was a complete and total failure. Right? The nuclear physicists and the mathematicians were fine with it. Everybody else said it was impossibly difficult. And so we then said, you know what we need to do? We need to make a compiler where you can just stick in a regular Solidity contract and spit out a zero-knowledge circuit. And that is exactly what Starlight does. Start with, it's in beta right now, but Starlight basically allows you to mark up a Solidity contract and just compile it and spit out a zero-knowledge circuit that you can run on public Ethereum or Polygon or any EVM-compatible ecosystem uh, and executes privately. And both of these are public domain, open source projects. We have built them and we have relinquished all ownership to them. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You should have been in the room where I explained this to our senior leadership. We're like, so wait a minute, you spent like 10 million bucks on this and you're giving it away? I did, I did not get snaps. I got looks. Um, and then lastly, this one we haven't decided what to do with yet, but it, it's called Starfall. And it allows these two things to interact together so that you can have coordinated, complex business processes on the public environment. And I'll explain a little bit, a bit more about each one of these. Nightfall is a layer two. It's a ZK optimistic rollup. The next version will be a ZK ZK. And it's pretty much a standard shield contract, right? Stuff goes in and it becomes invisible. Now, uh, some of you may have heard of Tornado Cash. Um, we obviously didn't want to go down the, the Tornado Cash path, but we did really want to retain the sort of fundamentally permissionless approach. To do that, basically what we've done is we, we had to, to lay out um, a, a requirement that you have an X.509 enterprise identity certificate to use Nightfall. Anybody can get an X.509. It's, it's only available for enterprises. They're issued by SSL providers. And uh, the way it works is you have to provide your enterprise identity information. It has to be vetted against the various sanctions list. And then you'll get a certificate. The good news is there's no 
there are many, many SSL certificate providers. So there is no gatekeeper. There's no bottleneck here. To be very clear, EY is not involved in this process. We're not involved in it. We're not controlling it. We're not the gatekeeper. Nothing. But it is a very effective, I'll call it bad actor deterrent, if you have to disclose your identity. And so this makes Nightfall confidential but not anonymous. So if you think about the landscape here, right, between identified and anonymous and public data and private data, you have something like an ENS account that's public and identified, right? Ethereum is pseudonymous and public. Tornado Cash, Aztec, Zcash, these are private and potentially anonymous or pseudonymous. And then where Nightfall fits is we are private but identified. And this is where really sort of differentiating this by explaining it's, it's really confidential, right? And um, it's, it's a unique kind of approach here. It's the best compromise we can find between being as maximally privacy focused as possible without being encouraging to potential bad actors, right? Which is, is just not what anybody wants in their system. Basically, it is, as we described, you can tokenize assets and move them around under privacy in this very, very kind of what will hopefully be a very large privacy ecosystem. It is today, I would say, relatively efficient. Um, we can do it for under a penny per transaction on the Polygon proof of stake network. We estimate when it's deployed, it'll be about 30 cents on the Ethereum mainnet for a fully private transaction. Right. And then our next version is under development now already. Nightfall version 4 will be a ZK, ZK roll-up. So we will, we will get away from the optimistic part, which will ease up any issues of like inputs and outputs and, and, and time windows. Starlight Zero Knowledge Compiler basically allows you to make an output that we're calling zaps. Right? These are zero knowledge applications. Right? You take your Solidity contract, you mark it up, you spit it into the compiler, and it basically creates this kind of black box, zero knowledge application that, that runs on Solidity. And the beauty of this is it allows you to execute these uh, business rules and transactions across a network. Right? And you can have consistency in your execution. One of the first things we're, we're going to make available is a product called Contract Manager. And what Contract Manager will allow you to do is, let's say you have a volume purchase agreement. I'll be able to guarantee a company that no matter what, when they order stuff, they will always get the terms they negotiated. If you, if you paid, if your deal says you get a volume discount at unit 1,000, this smart contract guarantees that no one has to remember when you order the 1,000 unit, the price goes down. Right? And, and I believe this will be very valuable. We, if, if you work in a large enterprise, you probably know companies are really good at negotiating agreements and very bad at actually keeping track of them five minutes after they've signed them. And then together, they can basically run with Starfall. Uh, we have a prototype running now, which basically allows us to have a set of independent smart contracts that run under privacy but control movements in this large sort of dark pool, which is the nightfall environment. So you get the maximum level of privacy possible. So that's how, that's how privacy gets done. But we haven't really talked about scalability. And the scalability is massive, and it's not really a well-solved problem. What, I, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen this explosion of layer two networks you know, in the Ethereum ecosystem. We've gone from an environment that basically kind of topped out at about a million transactions a day to one where we have many, many different layer twos. This, uh, this is from the end of uh, December 2021. Since then, it's become even bigger, right? So, so layer two networks allow for a, a much higher level of transaction scalability, but we still really haven't scratched the surface. And I'll, let me share with you one particular example. And it's just... Just back to the envelope math, but it gives you a sense of how, how, much, much how much volume we're talking about. Let's just take the automotive industry. There are 80 million cars that are produced each year, and the average electric vehicle has six major sub-assemblies, and the average sub-assembly moves five times before it ends up in the hands of a customer. 
right? So we haven't even talked about the, the most high-value parts. We're just talking about the subassemblies and the car as a whole. And if already, you're talking about 2.4 billion supply chain transactions per year for the automotive industry, right? Which works out to 76 transactions a second, which is three times the current capacity of the Ethereum mainnet, right? Not much more than that. Five times, five times the current capacity. And that's, this is just automotive. I have another client for one product in one product line, they want to mint 500,000 NFTs a day. 500,000 NFTs a day, and each one of those moves four times before it gets to the end user, which means that you need an average of two million transactions a day for one product, right? The volumes are going to be absolutely mind-boggling. Our current estimate is that the blockchain ecosystem needs to support somewhere on the order of 40 to 50 billion transactions a year, right? Uh, in order to, and I think that works out to 46,000 a second, in order to bring most major industries on chain. And by the way, every single one of those transactions has a very substantial amount of data associated with it, right? It's not just that I have six sub-assemblies. It's not enough to, to know that. I need to know if there's a battery, MSDS, mineral origin, country of origin, national parts, tax payments, right, usage history, right, the, the volume of data that's associated with these items is equally large, right? And so we have to get to a level of scalability which isn't supported by any of these centralized infrastructure that is available today, right? We cannot fill every data center in the world with our like compute and data storage associated with this level of industrial applications. So that's kind of where we need to get to. And, and I think we're, we're making pretty decent progress, but you know, the current centralized model does not scale. Does not scale to this level of volume. It provides a very high level of performance. It does not provide kind of the level of history and volume, particularly around data storage, that's gonna be necessary. Uh, will we get there? Yes, we will, but it's going to take longer. This is another kind of big theme, right? It is very easy to envision the future. It is actually really, really hard to make it happen. And one of my favorite examples is e-commerce, right? If you go back around the year 2000, industry analysts were saying, oh, e-commerce will be at $5 trillion by like 2010, right? No, it didn't happen. In fact, um, you know, uh, just U.S. retail e-commerce was supposed to hit $200 billion by 2005. In reality, it, it, it rose to $83 billion, right? Now, what's really interesting, though, is that over a time period, we all know what happened here, right? Eventually, that's exactly where we got to, right? It's currently at about <coughs> $150, $160 billion. Is that right? That was just in 2019. So it's gotten, like, everything, all these predictions actually got to the end state goal. But what happens is you just cannot scale that fast. It's very easy to envision this future state of, like, you know, 76 uh, or, you know, 40 billion transactions a year. It's actually, you're, if you look at all of these long-term growth infrastructure, whether it's uh, e-commerce, network computing, data centers, all of these things cap out at around 20 to 30% a year of growth over a period of 20 years. Now, over a period of 20 years, the, the volume of what you get to if you have 20 to 25% a year growth for 25 years is monumental, right? But that is the timeline that we all need to be thinking about. It's not two, this year, next year, it's a 25 year adoption timeline. Just remember, we're EY. We have clients who are like, so we're thinking about like moving stuff to the cloud. It's 2023, and they're just now, they're like, we have cloud stuff. Like, we're just getting started, right? We're in the late adopter phase, but we're in the late adopter phase after 20-some years, right? That is how long it is going to take to achieve this level of scale. We have to prepare ourselves for that kind of long-term ramp. But the good news is, by the way, is done right. There's 20, 25 years of growth ahead of us 
at 20 to 25 percent a year. Exactly. So that is my presentation. First of all, let me say thank you by offering you an NFT from EY. Our legal department says that you should not expect this to have any future value. Um, And this is my contact information, and I will take questions or comments or just gratuitous flattery. So congratulations, and thank you for contributing to open source. Uh, that is definitely the smart thing to do. That'll get you uh, a huge community. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that you're still trying to figure out what to do with uh, Starfall. Is the thought that you use that as the commercialization layer, or is there a potential for open sourcing that as well? Yeah, we're sort of still thinking about it, right? It's, it's uh, you know, one of the questions that you always get in, in when you donate a huge amount of stuff into open source is how are you going to differentiate yourself, right? Now, um, I, what I'm in discussion with our engineering team is, is Starfall so good that nobody else will be able to use this stuff without it? Or is it just something that gives us a bit of an advantage in the short run? And I, the answer for engineering is it gives us an advantage in the short run. And that may be all that it wants. Like they said, it's not, it's not the kind of thing that w we could patent and it would be so such a barrier to entry that other people could not use it. Other people will figure it out just as we did. So uh, I think Starfall may not be open source, but the others will continue to be open source. It's a uh, uh, public domain, like no license. No license, no... One of the things that was particularly important to me is we've all seen it. People are playing games with open source licenses now, the gotchas. We wanted a gotcha-free model. Hi. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on which uh, traditional enterprises have been the best at thinking about their blockchain strategy, beyond Ernest and Young, of course. So would love your, your hot take on top enterprises. And so it's not the enterprise. What we've discovered is it's a, person, it's a sponsor inside the enterprise. When you find the right sponsor who's willing to take some kind of risk, uh, that's really, really valuable, right? And Microsoft is a really good example, right? They, they built the Xbox video game system. That was done by somebody inside of Microsoft who was like, I want to be a visionary. I think we can do this. I, I see the value proposition. So it, it's much more often it's a person inside of an enterprise who's got a, a little bit of a, a vision, and they, they have the will to push it forward. Um, that being said, uh, the most receptive firms are the ones that are doing supply chain work and, and other stuff that's outside of financial services. Financial services and healthcare are highly regulated and that those companies have internal regulatory compliance teams that are very risk averse and so they're, they're slow to, to engage. Financial services is an interesting example. Um, if you officially, like all that financial services firms say, we're not doing blockchain stuff for the most part, especially in the United States in the, in the current environment. In practice, we know they're all building digital asset teams, they're all preparing for this environment, but they're waiting for regulatory clarity and they won't do anything substantial, especially in the US, until they have it. Hey, um, so I was just wondering, I, I think there are more unicorns on this earth than unqualified audits of cryptocurrency companies. Um, I was just curious, the moment we say cryptography and cryptocurrency in the same sentence, the auditors just run away. I'm assuming being at EY, if we use Nightfall, does this make it easier to get statements of, of this is what's happening in your company? Or would other firms, maybe not your firm, just run the other way because we're using zero dollar proof, dodge proofs, we're hiding business logic, what, what could be going wrong? So... Um First of all, I would say, you know, all the big four firms do audit cryptocurrency companies, including EY, right? I would say we're a little different in the sense that we've invested a lot more money in the understanding of the core technology. And I think we're the only ones who have like a real cryptography team with mathematicians and physicists. But in general, the issue getting a, especially a big four firm to audit you isn't 
that they don't understand or they are not willing to. The problem is in the audit business, you have unlimited liability, right? It, the, the risk of screwing up is monumental. And this makes big four firms very risk averse in, in terms of who they accept. They don't just want a low risk business, they want a low risk management team. We, I mean, it, it was kind of blew my mind when I came to UI. We have a process called client acceptance and not many companies make it through. Uh, because we vet all the directors, we vet all the senior leadership. You have to demonstrate not only that you're you're kind of a you know a good company run by good people, but you have rigorous business controls. Like we want to feel confident that the data coming out of your systems is very good. And it's not uncommon for like fast growing companies to spend. 15 or 20 million dollars in what's called audit readiness work, just to be ready to be audited. That's just kind of the, the re I think the regulatory environment makes auditors very, very risk averse. Um, in terms of zero knowledge circuits, I'm not so worried about that. Like, like as an auditor, you will, our audit team will be able to see both your private transactions and the public proofs. And we are certainly preparing for the day when we have audit clients who have zero knowledge transactions that, that are provable on chain and that you have to match up the off chain data and the private data to make all the pieces to come together. Yeah. Now, I was wondering which uh, industries do you think uh, will adopt this technology after the supply chain use case? And I don't know what your your thoughts are. Um, so I, I think you know, supply chain is is kind of our first stop. Procurement, um, financial services. I'm actually I think a financial services optimist. I think um, 12, 18, 24 months from now, we will we will have we already have something that starts to look like regulatory clarity in Europe. Um, the UK is, is on a, a pretty good track. Japan has now is underappreciated what an outstanding regulatory regime Japan has. Everybody who was a customer of FTX in Japan got all their money back. Right? Japanese regulators are probably the best cryptocurrency, crypto asset regulators on earth. They've run the most rigorous system, and they've they've made it they've they've made it rigorous but accessible. Like you can actually do business in Japan and and be successful there. And they're a really good benchmark. Um, it's, it'll take a little bit of time here, but even in this country, we're going to get there. We're going to have relatively clear regulation. And when that happens, the exaflood of assets that come into this environment is going to be monumental. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. Uh, emissions tracking, we're about to launch a product for emissions tracking and carbon traceability and carbon offsets. And, and I think we have the potential to create on the public networks, global carbon markets. And then, um, actually, the, the one that's really surprised me a lot is the slowness with which distributed computing and data storage have taken off. Like, if, I, if you had asked me, so, so uh, ten, 10 years ago, when I started on, on IBM's first blockchain, when I was at IBM, it was from managing decentralized device networks and making them sort of self-managing. And to be honest, you know, there's no regulatory requirements that are restricting anybody from building decentralized cloud infrastructure, uh, decentralized data storage. Like a lot of that stuff is relatively speaking largely unregulated. And it's been a huge surprise to me how slowly that space has taken off, to be honest. And I don't, I don't understand why. Last question. Oh, we got one behind there. Maybe that's not really a question, but I was I was winner of the e New York Hackathon precisely developing an anonymizer, a mixer, uh, exactly like with some of the capacities that you were describing. And I am curious if going to, you know, on the path to, to um, sorry. Nightfall. Da darkfall, yeah. Uh, is that... Do you think are you guys are you guys on the eyes of any regulatory bodies for for that or or how you know what what is seen as for EY in that case or or and, and I love to provide any feedback or or or, or expertise if you guys are still building a team. So we, I mean we have a full time team that's working on Nightfall and we continue to do that. We've been super transparent with the regulators. We have yet to hear any feedback 
from the regulators that's negative um, about it, right? Uh, we have taken the steps, I think, to, to deter kind of bad actors. But it's very interesting. You talk about an anonymizer and a mixer. This is actually something that doesn't work for enterprises. And the reason that, so, so today there are Tornado Cash and some of these others, Tornado Cash is a mixer, right? It's not really, it's not really a true privacy protocol. And it works great for ERC-20s because money is money, right? It works on Ethereum and it works with ERC, pardon? Yeah, it works on Ethereum. Right, but it, it works, it works very well with fungible tokens. The problem is almost everything that enterprises make and transact with each other is non-fungible, right? So this, this client of ours, it's a pharma company, they want to mint a half a million NFTs a day, right? Each package of medicine is serialized and unique. And so, you know, there's no mixer that you can use that you can't follow those NFTs all around the network, right? And so the problem was um, enterprises, they transact largely in non-fungible or semi-fungible items that are much more easily traceable and they need customized business logic and so we had to do something different than that. Um, the Tornado Cash thing really did make a step back. We, up until Tornado Cash, we had not worried about uh, kind of the, the um, what might happen to a developer if their system that they developed, which was public domain and open source, was misused. With Tornado Cash, it made us quite nervous, and we went back and we, we did make some adjustments to basically, you have to identify yourself to use this so that the regulators will know who you are, and it will be an effective deterrent, we hope, to, to potential bad actors, right? Our target market isn't individuals, it's enterprises only. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Great, great.